From Data Rails, this is FPNA Today. Hello, everyone. Welcome to a brand new FPNA podcast. I am your host, Paul Barnhurst, aka the FPNA Guy, and you are listening to FPNA Today. FPNA Today is brought to you by Data Rails, financial planning and analysis platform for Excel users. Every week, we will welcome a leader from the world of financial planning and analysis and discuss some of the biggest stories and challenges in the world of FPNA. We will provide you with actionable advice about financial planning and analysis. This is going to be your go-to resource for everything FPNA. I am thrilled to welcome today's guest on the show. Francisca, welcome to the show. Thank you for having me, Paul. We're very excited to have you. So let me just give a little bit of background and then we'll uh, give you an opportunity to tell a little bit more about yourself. So Francesca Hell's originally from Italy. She's currently located in the UK. And she's an expert when it comes to digital transformations. I learned a little bit about her through uh, LinkedIn and then went out and checked out her website and saw that she is really an expert in the space. She's currently self-employed as a consultant for financial transformations. She previously served as a director at Diageo as where she was the global director of a source to pay transformation project. She has a business website that she runs, Chris's Digital Transformation for CFOs. And we're really excited to have her on the show today. So again, thanks for taking the time to join us. Sure. So can you maybe tell us just a little bit about your career? I know if I remember right, you started in accounting. You started, you worked on a couple different transformations and then started your own practice. So maybe just walk us through a little bit of your background and how you ended up where you're at today. Uh, it's an interesting uh, it's an interesting uh, question uh, paul i actually came to live in the uk in london where i still am after i concluded my finance and accounting qualification and that was the best thing i could do because finance and accounting is the kind of competence of specialism that really sets you up in your career Mm -hmm. So when I got to London, instead of working as a barista or in a pizzeria, (laughs) I I was immediately able to work in the finance and accounting department of the Intercontinental Hotel Corporations. That stood me up in in good stead for my later career in uh, financial and management accounting and also for when eventually I got into IT in the mid-90s. So finance, uh, my accounting qualification gave me both a start, a good start in my professional adult life, Mm -hmm. as well as a great springboard for a career in IT and now a career in uh, advising the CFO, in digital transformation, in understanding automation, etc., etc., yeah, no, that's a great background. And I can I can see where, you know, kind of naturally fit together the accounting and finance. And then the 90s come when you start seeing the explosion of systems. And That's exactly right, Paul. I saw in the mid-90s that it was essential that you had uh, IT skills as you went up to the to the year 2000. And I, one of my first jobs in IT was... Uh, being a system analyst in Mm -hmm. uh, ERP implementations. That gave me a great understanding of the architecture of a a business application that was absolutely um, essential in my later uh, career, as I say. No, and that that totally makes sense. And, you know, my first experience is similar to yours as a system analyst, and it was working on a, a software project on the procurement side before uh-huh. I moved into FP&A. But it was you know, invaluable to see that process and to learn more about how you implement a system. And it should tell us, actually, it should tell us uh, your career, my career, that kind of background um, should be a, a lesson that I'm very willingly uh, sharing for the type of competencies that the younger generation need to keep themselves relevant in the marketplace. We are at a historically almost unique time when technology is increasingly intelligent, literally Mm so. Therefore, it is increasingly um, 
essential that uh, finance people really understand the technology. It's no longer just about the numbers, just about the, the, the figures. It also has to be about the technology that underpins your financial financial accounting, financial planning and analysis, etc. No, I totally agree. I mean, having the right technology stack and the ability to get actionable insights out of your data is invaluable in this time of uncertainty and change. You know, more important than it's ever been before. And the exciting, the exciting thing, Paul. Um, I mean, you and I, we are not five minutes into any conversation that we get excited about FP&A. But, <laughs> but uh, I think the exciting thing is, uh, to an extent, the challenges uh, in finance are the same, right? It is about the management of cash. It is about driving efficiencies, uh, um, keeping the co- cost out of business. But the enabling tools are not. This is the uniqueness of this historical moment. Because right now, AI, artificial intelligence, allows the integration of this, of external data that has not been traditionally used by, by accountant, by CFOs, by the FPNA teams. Data, external data such as sentiment uh, analysis harnessed uh, via the social media, the weather, the lockdown states. And that provides an extraordinary insight, in, insight when it's aligned to the internal data where again the new FPNA tool allow the integration with uh, the unified internal data from your ERP, your CRM, your, your HR, your uh, human resources manager, your HRM systems, etc. Mm-hmm. That's why we, uh, that's why it is now called, maybe it's a fashionable uh, definition, uh, moniker, but we call it X. Uh, PNA, no longer just mm-hmm. simply FPNA. And in, it indicates specifically this augmentation of capabilities of human intelligence that the new artificial intelligence, the new automation, cognitively intelligent tools allow. Yeah, no, definitely the tools are reshaping the way we think about things. But, you know, before we can get advantage of those tools, we have to get them successfully deployed, right? I mean, that that's critical. And, you know, on your website, I noticed you talked about three things that are critical for a deployment. And you said, act strategically, deploy effective change management. And then kind of my favorite, because I think we often miss it, is put your house in order. Can you maybe talk a little bit about why, why those three things are really the key to a successful deployment? Sure. So the first two, if you like, strategy and change, they come from the systematization of research conducted uh, by the London School of Economics on automation projects. They have found, the LSE has found, the 75% of failure in these automation projects come from a lack of a strategic alignment within the enterprise and a lack of change management uh, uh, capability. So on the strategy front, if you like, the recommendation is to standardize uh, uh, the processes, um, actually centralize the processes, standardize them, optimize them, and then and only then automate. Now, this, uh, yes, it comes from a theoretical perspective that I quoted the LSE when I recently did a course on automation, but it it aligns very, very deeply with my own experience. I've been on projects, I've seen steering boards misaligned on the basics of the transformation. And now, especially now, the difficulties, uh, rela- the difficulty is in the fact that everybody 
the CFO is under extraordinary pressure to automate. Extraordinary pressure. So everybody wants to automate. And, and, uh, the software vendors are very clever. A, because they, their products are increasingly truly intelligent. And the technology out there is miraculous. But of course, they tend to oversell all their cognitive technology as artificial intelligence. And therefore, often they confuse the, the, the CFO. They confuse the enterprise. So, Definitely the recommendation is to align on the, on the, um, strategic aspect of the transformation. The second is the change management. Change management is a discipline very much misunderstood. People think that uh, you have done a workshop for an afternoon with people and you think we, didn't, we need to do some communication and some training and people think that there is change management. It isn't. And I've come up in my experience, in my profession, with a methodology that plugs the change management into the delivery practices. So wrapping the change management around some governance, uh, uh, work uh, with, uh, with the, the, the project uh, team, uh, the business uh, operations team working together to get to the goal of the transformation. Mm -hmm. So this is my change management. Now, what I would claim uh, absolute uh, as being of my own invention is the put in the house in order because it seems to me as I look at uh, all these clever solutions from the clever software vendor and I think there is no there's no artificial intelligence solution that will fix your problem that will give you magically a finance information model this is what you have to do. You have to have a, a, the properly designed uh, finance information model that feeds all your operation financial management reporting requirements. Then you have to embed it uh, in the ERP as the thread that binds all the technology together. So the ERP would feed all the downstream systems such as the data data warehouse and it's essential that the financial information model should be well designed well deployed uh, and 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 so on of course i have touched on the criticality of the data quality data governance data compliance data control but part of the third element for me of putting your house in order is that Please, please make sure that the ERP is fully configured, avoiding the need for the manual accounting. There's so much, so much of it is done at the month end with the, the poor finance analysts running around doing manual journals to fix transactions that have not posted into the general ledger because of a shoddily configured ERP. These are the very, very basic. And putting the house in order simply appeals, Paul, to don't invest money in artificial intelligence, expensive solution, if you haven't done these basic things yet. Does that make sense? It, it makes total sense. You know, what they say is, you know, many transformations you look at, you know, planning tools, they end up back in Excel without a tool. They end up using it as a repository, right? They Because they, de they haven't put their house in order. They haven't really thought through what they need or manage change management. And if you don't manage it right, people go back to what they're comfortable with. You know, I've seen two projects in my career, and these are more around, you know, kind of billing projects. But I came into a company where we had outsourced a portion of our billing to, uh, you know, an outsourced firm and we really didn't have a tool. They were doing it all manually. And it was such a problem. We brought it back in house. And the first year we brought it back in house, the team found nearly $12 million between customers not being billed, stuff sitting on balance sheets that didn't belong there, you know, all those type of things. And we were trying to save money 
And we, we obviously we didn't save any money if we had $12 million we hadn't recognized. Of course. You know, and so and I've seen that more than once in my career. You know, others where yes. outsourcing stuff before you've standardized your billing process and then wondering why you have more uh, billing problems than you did absolutely. before. Absolutely. And I have to tell you, Paul, when I hear the likes of your experience, which completely aligns with mine, I think, why aren't we finance practitioners of old? Why don't we say these things more powerfully, more publicly, more uh, uh, creating the kind of uh, conversation that is painful, that, but it must be had, you know? Otherwise, uh, you create distress. You, you, you actually don't create value. You destroy value in the organization. So, no, that's a great point. And, you know, finance is, you know, we like to say we're business partners and we want to be steward of value creation. One of the key areas is we have to speak up on these projects because we've all, we've all seen them. And I'm sure many of us at some point or another have kept quiet, even though we know it's going to be a disaster. And, you know, we know there's some <laughs> things they forgot. Like I remember I, I was new into a company that I'd come in and they were testing something and every single person I asked about it goes, this is going to be a disaster. They'd already made the decision and a year later they wrote the project off and started over. Yeah. And I was like, you know, either people didn't listen or people didn't speak up enough, but either way, yeah. I mean, for my, you know, I was two months in and it was apparent to me that nobody believed this thing was going to work. Yeah. And I'm like, okay, well, you didn't manage change management for sure. If nobody <laughs> believes it's going to work. And you probably haven't put your house in order. And so odds are, this is going to be one of those that just fails. You know, as we talk about, we see that very common. So, you know, I noticed you kind of, you started your own, your own practice and transformations. What, what led you to start, start your own practice? Why did you decide to do that? Very simply, uh, the project uh, for which uh, that you alluded to at the beginning, uh, the, this global transformation of the source to pay domain at Diageo, there was a, a project supporting a billion pound of uh, uh, a billion pounds sterling of uh, indirect spend. I was mm -hmm. director of transformation there. Now, Diageo is a global corporation is an amazing company. They have their uh, delivery methodology is super robust, uh, is super well thought out, thought through, super, etc. It still mm -hmm. took me to bring the teams together, to bring the business uh, acceptance group together, make sure that they were aligned, they were be, that they would be given a voice in approving the design and the implementation of the new solution so that they felt completely part of the transformation. They were not just teams to which the transformation was done to. They became, mm -hmm. uh, they were entitled to ask the reasons behind the solution, to review the solution, to work with the project analyst in improving the solutions. And uh, I was able to make them so uh, regionally, locally powerful so that they in turn uh, um, enlisted, engaged uh, their, uh, the super user, the local super users. And then together with the program director and I, the overall program director and I, we had a great uh, um, uh, engagement program for all the, uh, for all the regional and central leaders. Mm -hmm. So that we would go to them, we would, ex we would explain uh, what the solution would transform within the agile, within that domain. And then we would say, and we are training your people and we are working with your business acceptance group people. They understand the solution. They have signed off the design, the UAT, and they are signing off launch. Are you happy to also support launch? Of course, by that point, when you brought the negotiation so tight, so closely to where it matters, then people can't say no, right? 
Mm-hmm. And we did. And when I joined, uh, you, you know, I joined in uh, in the in a at the end of one year, and we had been we had we were live globally by the October of the following year. Now, when I finished that project, I thought it really I've seen now um, how essential uh, is to be able to drive the transformation strongly. You know, to have somebody that really drives, goes after the issues, engages the leadership, works with people, motivates people. And that is what I then thought, right, this is it. You know, I've done enough uh, IT as a a project manager, you know, IT Mm -hmm. has been great to me, but actually my calling is now within that kind of enterprise change management, engage in the leadership type role. That's why I set myself up as a consultant doing that. No, that makes sense. And as I listened to you tell that story, that was fascinating. But a couple of things, you know, that stuck out to me is one is communication, right? You communicated, you communicated, you communicated. And just as important, if not more so, is you communicated and empowered. Right. You ask people to test. You ask them to be involved because we've all been part of the projects where they yeah. communicate in the sense of we're going to shove this down your throat. Here's the communication yeah. Yeah. versus we want you to be happy with this and we want to make your life easier. And, you know, there's definitely a difference between that. And people pick it up really quick when it's a shove down your throat type of communication versus empowering and involving people. So I really like that example because I can see how you made sure you put things in place, you know, to increase those chances of success. I am a believer, uh, um, absolute believer in democracy. You know, an enterprise transforms with the participation of all its people. But I don't just pay lip service to these concepts. You have to be able to articulate them across governance, uh, across uh, cross vertical plannings uh, with the between the business readiness uh, the business acceptance group and the other work stream within the project you know it has to be an absolutely aligned governance aligned set of con- concepts aligned set of teams because when you do that and you bring people together you'll soon find out that when people get to know each other they'll work well together, right? And you think, Mm -hmm. wow, this is a no-brainer, right? This is an absolute no-brainer. But then again, Paul, I am, uh, for me, communication is something that, communication with a view to engage uh, is something that I've been doing since I was a girl. I was the first one of six. And I (laughs) soon found out that I needed to be able to clearly uh, aligned with my younger brothers and sisters so that they would be quiet when I was <laughs> start, uh, trying to study. <laughs> that yeah. gave me great uh, skills for my, for my later, later life, as it is often the case. Yeah. Ha- having a lot of siblings <laughs> teaches you a lot of lessons. I a grew lot. up in a family of seven. I was the middle child, but <laughs> I, can, I can relate to some of that. So... <laughs> You were lucky because you were kind of lost in there, whereas you were <laughs> always up there to be to be told, it must be your fault, you're the eldest. <laughs> That's no, funny. I hear I could hear you on that one. So yeah, I did get lost a little bit being that middle child. <laughs> but kind of switching gears here just a little bit, a few months back, you wrote a piece about the predictions called Predictions for Finance, the Changing Landscape. And you talk specifically about FP&A and your thoughts on FP&A in that article. Can you share a little bit, you know, what prompted you to write that article and kind of maybe some of those key things about FP&A? Yes, sure. So I, as a change manager, to an extent, you don't have to be a finance specialist as well. But Mm -hmm. I wanted to keep my finance specialism because I have always found it a differentiator. Sure. Um, there's a couple of things in fine, interesting things in finance. One is the aspect of the automation of the operational finance, if you like, and that takes place more 
on uh, the implementation of tools such as uh, robotic uh, process automation that automates the more manual tasks in the domain Mm -hmm. of purchase to pay, quote to cash, R to R. But the other exciting thing is the FP&A. I alluded uh, at the beginning, actually, uh, Paul, uh, the finance, uh, F- FP&A, uh, its history has always been manual, historically focused, control-driven, siloed. The future of FP&A is more, will have more a focus on the predictive analytics, on value-added scenario planning, on advanced forecasting, on the better visualization of data, on the real-time insights. So that, that to me, what attracted me uh, and uh, to write about FPNA or what is now becoming known of known as XPNA is the excitement of all these things because, as I said, the challenges in finance are the same, but the enabling tools are not. The enabling tools with AI absolutely are extraordinary in allowing the integration of external data, not traditionally used, with uh, internal data. You know, if you think about a tool even a, a super simple tool like uh, Microsoft Power BI is a, a, a very powerful tool mm-hmm. because it has a data repository where which sources data from many uh, sources, right? External and internal, and then allows the visualization of this data, which being visualized is more easily communicatable to the business operations. You know, it, it's you explain a, a well-designed graphics. It's easier to explain than just a complex uh, spreadsheet with a lot of macro in it, mm-hmm. right? And I found, wow, that is, is extraordinarily exciting future for finance. I don't know if I have, you and I have discussed this on LinkedIn, but the Wall Street Journal has done a, a very interesting uh, series of articles uh, recently on, uh, on uh, the CFO and the way they see their, their future, the future of their function, the future of their teams. And they interviewed the, the senior finance leader at Google and Microsoft, uh, at uh, Prudential Financials and uh, uh, Applied Materials. And I found it very interesting that all the leaders there recognize the power of the new uh, automation tools. Mm -hmm. Machine learning, for example, or the fact that you can use NLP, natural language, uh, processing and natural language search to interrogate data, for example, mm-hmm. in Microsoft uh, uh, Power BI. They recognize all of this as well as recognizing the need to upskill their finance team, not teams, not just in becoming proficient in the use uh, of the new technologies, but also in becoming great communicators, great negotiators and providers of insight to the business operations, thus becoming true business partner. Now, I find that extraordinary. And and having been in finance for a very long time, I know that the CFO are at the very center of that process of extraordinary transformation of their enterprise, but also of finance. And and let's face it, CFOs have always been there with the technology. They have been working with ERP and going mad with ERP since the 70s, the 80s, right? So they're very well positioned to now harness, harvest the new technology. That's what fascinates me about the FPNA 
uh, space. Does that make sense? Uh, for- no, it totally does. And I can completely relate to that is just, you know, fp a has totally changed. You know, a couple of things you said. One, the technology is exciting. You know, things you can do in Excel, just Excel today to 10 years ago, if people learn new yes. Excel. I mean, you can do, you can query Excel like you can BI, right? It has yep. natural language in there. You can do fuzzy matching. You got an SQL tool. You got connectors. I mean, you got a data model. So many things that, you know, most people have no idea. And then you start to go beyond that to all these customized tools for certain use cases, you know, a pl- planning tool or, uh, you know, a payment tool or whatever that may be. They're much more intelligent, much more customizable ability to automate than they used to be. But, you know, as you get back to, I love you said, you know, it's kind of fp a is, you know, CFOs are getting their arms around all this data. And you talked about, you know, the, the next thing that the employees need, we see a lot of that, is you hear the term thrown around all the time, business partnering now, right? Something fp a should have always been doing, but it's kind of that buzzword today, along with xp a the idea of, you know, finance needs to be that hub that brings the planning together operationally, finance, strategically, and helps influence and create value for the business. And that requires, like you said, upskilling. The skills of Excel 10 years ago or whatever tool you were using are, are no longer sufficient to really analyze and drive value. You know, being able to visualize, whether it be Power by AI, Tableau, whatever, right? We could list 20 different tools. But those things... And then being able to bring that together and influence the business. It's exciting how technology serves as an enabler. If yes. we're willing to put in the effort to implement it right and upskill ourselves so that we can take advantage of what's available to us today. It's super exciting. And, uh, and of course, at the same time, uh, people, this is hopefully it's not just another fashionable idea, but it is the case that people can be freed up, freed up to do more added value work. As they mm-hmm. move away from all the, you know, the having to do the manual journals because the ERP is not fully configured, because there's always some kind of data to go and clean up. Well, the, the role, especially of the FP&A analyst, uh, goes from being an admin role to being a strategic role. And with those intelligent solutions, with these automated tools, intelligent tools, analysts can play what-if scenarios, you know, testing assumptions and seeing the impact of decisions ahead of making them. That's a great point of being able to see, you know, the impact of a decision before you make it, being able to do that scenario planning, understanding your drivers. So as we talk about all this, I think sometimes, you know, I get a lot of notes on LinkedIn, different things. I think people don't know where to start or they get a little intimidated thinking my job's going to be automated away, right? Whether they're an accountant or wherever they are in finance. Yeah. So as yeah. we talk about, you know, kind of specifically fp and as you look at, you know, how things have changed over the last decade. What do you see as kind of those key skills somebody needs to focus on to be successful? What do you see kind of, you know, as, the, as we go forward into the future? There, there's, I suppose there's uh, many answers than one might give, uh, but perhaps I can share what I have done a couple of years ago, okay? Because I'm a great believer that uh, the only skill that you have to develop across your life is to keep close to where the market is going so that you keep yourself relevant. A couple of years ago, I thought, okay, so I knew I was going to set myself up, as you know, as we discussed after my Diageo experience as an advisor to the CFO. But a couple of years ago, we started Two, three years ago, there was a lot of talk about automation, RPA, AI, cognitive uh, automation. And I think, oh my God, what is all of that? So I'm somebody that I've always loved technology, even though it's not, uh, if you like, natural to my culture or to my generation. That's why I got myself into technology, because I would be damned if I didn't understand it. Okay. And uh, two or three years ago, I thought, right, let me go and uh, find out about automation. So I did a course at the London School of Economics on the 
a business uh, on the implementation in business uh, of automation technology. Well, it was a mind-blowing course. <laughs> that is yeah. where I learned about RPA, about uh, cognitive uh, uh, automation technology. And that is also where I learned that when people say, you know, all the clever software vendor, they sell their solution as artificial intelligence. Oh, it's not really artificial intelligence. It certainly isn't artificial general intelligence, which is the, the reaching of parity with humans. But to cut a long story short, get yourself absolutely upskilled on the technology. If you are an FPNA analyst, go and find out the latest uh, on the on the automated FPNA, which are the best tools. What is the essential item of the automate? Why why is that technology automated? Does it build on machine learning? Is it built on machine learning? How does the machine learning actually works? How do you train the system, the tool, the application in really getting better the, the true meaning of the machine learning, if you like. That's what you have to understand. And if the tool gives you visualization of data, go and learn about that as well. I, I, I learn to communicate to the business operation in, uh, in using those terms. So that is a great, uh, that's what I've done. And sure enough, I've written a blog on uh, clarity on all this various RPA, AI, CA, etc. Ultimately, the emperor really has no clothes. It really doesn't take a lot to understand, but it's important to understand. It's important to keep yourself up to date, resilient, see where the market goes, and make sure that you can skill yourself up to go with it. But if you are employed, talk to your employers. Employers now are starved of people with digital skills. In the UK, there is a great dearth of digital skills, right? So employers should absolutely help people upskill, whether it's paying for the training or, or retraining them, etc. Don't feel that the technology will take away your work. I mean, that's the subject of a completely different podcast. <laughs> but if you keep yourself uh, up skilled, it is very unlikely that the technology will take away completely your ability to earn a living. Does that make yeah. sense, uh, Paul? No, it completely does. And I totally agree with you. We hear all the, the buzzwords and they're nice and there's great technology with them. But if you understand the market, you understand how to use the tools, you understand how to do analysis and communicate and drive value, you will always yep. be valued. Yeah. And, you know, and that's the, and that's the key. Know where the market's going, make sure you're relevant, make sure you can communicate and you have the appropriate technical skills to add value. And you'll always find employment. Sometimes going to be difficult. Sure. We've all had challenges, but you'll be yep. prepared and you'll be in a better position than, you know, many of the people around you. Yeah. And don't forget that this post-COVID world is also giving us great opportunities. I now mm -hmm. work regularly with teams that are, you know, at the other side of the world. Teams yep. that we would not have worked together beforehand because you couldn't reach them. Uh, they were, you know, they were a business trip away. Now we are all there working with the new communication and collaboration technologies it's uh, it's incredible the amount it's it's incredible what you learn from people that you would never once come across i love that i love that no i do as well like just you know the fact that if linkedin wasn't there you and i probably would have never connected right exactly. we'd never have this opportunity to be here chatting and i think you know today this morning i was on the phone with somebody in india and yes. i'm on you know on the phone with someone in the uk next i'm going to yeah. be on the phone with someone in michigan on a call yeah. in California, you know, and by the end of the day, I'll also on the phone with some people here in Utah and, you know, so all over different countries, different states. It's, it's amazing the opportunity that technology has brought us. It really I is. Agree. I agree. And I love it. 
So just a, just a few more questions here for you. As, as you look at, you know, kind of FP&A and where it's going in the future, what do you see as maybe its biggest challenge and then its biggest opportunity going forward? The biggest challenge is, is very simple, is the change management. Because that, the, the description I gave a few moments ago uh, of uh, how FP&A will change it's not going to come about miraculously. It's going to come about with, an, with a, a very deep program of change management so that uh, uh, all the impacted communities understand what's coming and have the opportunity to contribute. So if I were a CFO embarking on an FP&A transformation, I'll call a good change manager. Okay, somebody that actually somebody that subscribe subscribes to my way of doing change. <laughs> <laughs> so strategy alignment, change management capabilities, putting the house in order, right? It would take me 30 minutes, 20 minutes, 30 minutes with a CFO to just list the essential things that they ought to be considering in order to give their FP&A transformation a, um, you know, a, the best chance to succeed. Okay. So definitely the challenge relies, uh, is within the, the change, the change management. A and uh, at the same time, you know, make sure that, the, that there is a strategic alignment within that, right? So that, mm -hmm. We don't just automate FP&A because we must, you know, let's uh, do the financial information model first, clean the data, et cetera, et cetera. And the opportunities, it's, I think the, the, the best opportunities are to do with the fact that instead of just looking at what history tells you, now suddenly with a predictive analytic, you see, you start looking into the future and looking at what the external environment tells you. I was referring to earlier as sentiment analysis that you can um, harvest from social media, uh, the weather, the lockdown states, all these external input and insight coupled with your internal understanding of your business is going to be the biggest opportunity and the best opportunity for FP&A. No, I like that. It, it's exciting to think when you marry internal and external what you can learn, right? There's a lot of opportunity there. So kind of a question that would be interesting to our audience. Tell us something that you know, not many people would know about you, something they may not find online, something kind of unique? <laughs> it's, a, it's a trick question right there, Paul. <laughs> <laughs> oh, okay. So I suppose I am a heavily vegan vegetarian. That, that would do. That we and do. What, what made you decide to be a heavy uh, vegan, vegan vegetarian? <laughs> <laughs> uh, just uh, expediently, I had one of my sisters that lived with me um, in London many years ago. She was a great cook, unlike me. So I would go home and the, the house would smell of this beautifully cooked fresh bread. And I started eating her food and never looked back. <laughs> no, that's great. And yeah, I, I can imagine good cook. Uh, good food is something I love, so I can appreciate yeah. that. <laughs> I say, it's something I love to eat. <laughs> I, I do as well. It's why I find I have to exercise more these days. <laughs> okay. Well, I do that a lot. So I have a big tick next to exercise. <laughs> <laughs> uh, funny. So, as you know, you know, D Data Rails is uh, an FP&A platform based on Excel. And so I'm curious, do you have a favorite Excel function? <laughs> That's another fantastic question. So, unlike uh, uh, the, a lot of noise that you hear now about Excel, uh, we shouldn't use Excel, 
I absolutely don't agree with that. Excel is still one of the very powerful. It's a powerful tool wherever you deploy it. And as you say, Paul, now the functionality within Excel is extraordinary. In Microsoft Power BI, Excel can just be another source of data. But to your question, my absolute favorite, and I no longer use Excel as I did when I was uh, a finance analyst myself, sure. but the pivot table. I mean, the pivot table, how quickly can you get at an understanding of the data from 20,000 miles above the earth unless you had a pivot table? You tell me. <laughs> <laughs> No, I, I, I love a good pivot table. I think I spend some time pretty much every day in a pivot table, it feels like, you know, less less so now as I'm going into my own business, but definitely during my, you know, finance careers, I'm doing those analysis often in a pivot table. It's a fabulous tool. It's so fabulous I, I appreciate tool. that yeah. answer. It's always fun <laughs> to see what what functions and things different people different people pick. Yeah. So I appreciate when I, that. When I ask uh, my teams, when I say, well, can I have that? Can I have that? visibility of the data. Can you tell me this and that? And they say, oh, oh, I feel a pivot table coming on. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, I'm simply spreading the knowledge, you know, so. <laughs> you know, so, so funny story. I worked with a boss that, you know, he'd worked in investment banking and he was phenomenal in Excel and building models. But one day he admitted to me, he had never admitted, he goes, you know, I've actually never used pivot tables. I really ah. don't know how to use them. And I'm like, they're easy. You really need to figure it out. And took some time in showing them. And you could just see, you know, he'd seen a plenty of analysis done in it, but he had never really known how to do them himself. And it was a, kind of an eye-opening moment, I think, when he realized, you know, how much more they added to the things he was doing. Absolutely. So that's a great one. Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> well, I've I've thoroughly enjoyed visiting with you today. Really appreciate you carving out some time, and I'm glad it's worked well this time. You know, we didn't have the technical <laughs> problems like our first our first attempt at this. Is Francesca knows we had a few challenges, so we she was grateful enough to come back and you know visit with us again. And you know, we were just excited to have you on the show, and look forward to seeing you on LinkedIn, and you know, kind of following you as you continue forward in your career because we need more people that are out there championing championing for change management and for you know transformations because really transforming the back end and the technology along with the processes the you know the people and getting that house in order can allow fpna to do extraordinary things so i'm you know really thankful for your time today again thanks for being on the show and thank you for having me paul it's been my pleasure you have a great day francesca enjoy your you uh, evening and we'll chat soon we'll chat soon <laughs>